Hi everybody, Captain Al speaking. Welcome to training tips designed to help make you a better, more knowledgeable flight swimmer, pilot, or aviation enthusiast. Have a seat, strap in, stow the HUD, and we'll see what's on the horizon for today. Our briefing today will cover The Electronic Flight Instrument System, or EFIS, we're looking at the ND navigation display, and specifically we're looking at the map mode of the ND. The map mode is the mode we use most frequently. Uh, on the EFIS control panel you can select uh, one of four modes, and the map mode is the mode that we're looking at now. It's a moving map representation of your route of flight. It's oriented in the direction that you're flying. And moving from the top, we have an expanded compass rose. This expanded compass rose, when you're in, the mo in this mode, goes on 80 degrees from side to side. Just to the right of that, we have speed and wind data. Uh, we have ground speed and we have true airspeed. On takeoff, sometimes you'll notice uh, when you're looking at the PFD, you may notice uh, a little flash on the PFD at 100 knots when the true airspeed starts to be displayed. Uh, ground speed would be there through your taxi and through your uh, takeoff roll, but true airspeed is added at 100 knots, and so you'll see kind of a little white flash of that on your ND coming up when you're looking at your PFD, you'll catch it out of the corner of your eye. Next to that we have a uh, our orientation as far as uh, the way we're heading. This happens to be a track up display. Some airlines prefer heading up display. Most people use track up. Um, for more information on that you can check the uh, EFIS heading video that talks about the difference between track up and heading up. Next to that we have active waypoint data. In this case our active waypoint is Zugap. And the time and the distance to the active waypoint are listed below it. In this case we're going to get to Zugap at 1629.4 Zulu and it's 20.5 nautical miles in front of us. Moving down below that, you have the, just as we talked about, you have the active route. It's displayed as a magenta line. Now the airplane, when you're in LNAV or lateral navigation, will fly from waypoint to waypoint along that magenta line. Um, the other combinations you could have, an inactive route would be a blue dashed line, and a modified route would be a dashed white line. The active waypoint is always magenta. In this case, again, as we said, it's a zoo gap. And uh, the information on the upper right is for that active waypoint. Any waypoints behind or any waypoints in front of the active waypoint, which are called down track waypoints, would be white. The range is in the middle of, in this case, in the expanded mode. You'll see the range is right in the middle of the ND. Half the selected range is shown. In this case, we're in the 40 nautical mile range, and uh, halfway between 20 nautical miles is shown. You can see there's uh, index marks below and index marks above the 20 mile range, which in this case would represent 10 miles and uh, 30 miles, with the top being 40 miles. So half the selected range is shown in the middle of the ND. You have an altitude range arc, that's this uh, green arc uh, right here. And whenever you're making a climb or descent, that shows where you're going to reach the MCP selected altitude, and it's based on your current vertical rate. As your vertical speed changes, as your vertical rate changes, that altitude range arc will move in and out as well. Moving to the bottom of the map mode, you have the map source on the left. Uh, this is normally when you make selections on your EFIS control panel, such as waypoint or airport. Uh, that will be labeled on in this section. You can see right now the weather radar is on. It's in the weather plus turbulence mode. 
the TFC indicates the uh, TCAS is on with traffic being displayed. And right now we have no other map switches on our EFIS control panel on. But if you were to put, for example, the airport switch on, then it would uh, show airport in blue ARPT or waypoint WPT. And waypoints would be displayed on the ND. Just below that are two nav aids. These would be the nav aids that are coming from your nav rad page on the uh, L1 area of the nav rad page and the R1 area of the nav rad page. These are the nav aids that are being automatically tuned by the FMC or uh, manually tuned if you were to put in a nav aid. Next to that in white would be the airport uh, symbol or the airport runway depending on the range. Uh, generally in the lower ranges, usually anything from 40 miles uh, less, you'll have the airport symbol uh, there at the actual airport runway along with a white dashed line and you can see that here you've got the runway and there's a dashed line that extends out from both ends of the runway that represents an extended center line that goes out for 14.2 miles on either side uh, if you were to get above the 40 mile range if you went into the 80 mile range then the airport goes to a uh, it's not a runway symbol but it's a blue circle uh, denoting that runway along with the uh, ICAO identifier for that airport the uh, present position is the white triangle. We'll talk more about that in a minute. We are at the tip of the triangle. The nav source, uh, in this case, is uh, GPS and IRS3. Uh, what that means is that the all three IRUs are being used for the uh, triple mix position. And then the IRS inertial position is being updated uh, by GPS. Since both our GPS receivers are working and they're receiving uh, position information, then that's the information that's used to update the uh, IRU uh, inertial position. We'll see more of that here in a minute. In fact, we'll see more of it now. Um, this is just a representation of our present position. Again, we said our present position is at the tip of the triangle. There are three IRUs, a left, center, and right. And these IRUs are displayed as little starred symbols. Usually they're very close together because they're very, very accurate. We have to tell the present position during the pre-flight phase. Once we give the IRU its present position at the gate, for example, then the IRSs are all, or the IRUs are all on their own for the rest of the flight. They're never updated. The IRUs are never updated. Uh, if you go on an 18 hour flight, then over time they are subject to some error that will accumulate. The three IRUs are combined into a, what's called a triple mix position. And that becomes what's called the FMC inertial position. That's denoted by the uh, a little white X, which is right at the tip of the triangle. That would be the combination of the three IRSs into one position, which becomes the FMC inertial position. That FMC inertial position is then updated in one of many forms. Uh, the most accurate form would be GPS position updating. Uh, we have, there's several satellites in the air and then the airplane usually has two GPS receivers that receive information from the satellites and then can fix our position uh, to a specific uh, latitude longitude. That information becomes the updated GPS position. The airplane will then prefer to go to that position because that's the most accurate. The three IRSs combined into one still remain uh, because the IRSs sit there and do their thing for the next 18 hours. They drift and they wander and uh, again, very accurate, but they will be subject to some error. The difference between the uh, radio position, in this case, the GPS position 
and the FMC inertial position will be called the bias. And you can see that here in the uh, diagram. This would be the inertial position. This would be the GPS uh, lat long position from the uh, our receivers. And you can see that the difference then would be a bias and it would maintain that bias as long as we're using GPS uh, radio updating. If for some reason our GPS receivers failed, then we'd be down to uh, DME, DME position updating, where the system could locate two VORs with DMEs, uh, swing their arcs, and as long as it, there's several logic criteria that it uses, but uh, it would fix a position, a radio update position based on DME, DME. And again, the airplane would uh, have an FMC inertial position, but it would fix a DME, DME arc position. And then the difference between the bias and the actual radio updated position uh, would be, again, that's called the bias. So if we degraded from here, then it would look for one VOR with a radial DME to update off of. And uh, it can do that within, there's certain logic criteria that it has to maintain. It has to be pretty close to the VOR. The angular distance has to be right. Uh, but it could use a single VOR with radial DME distance to fix its position. And then, of course, if it doesn't have that, then it may revert uh, back to the IRS position if there's no radios to update off of. Usually on the localizer, when you capture the localizer, it updates off the localizer. So you can see in the modern day aircraft today, we kind of go from uh, a GPS to DME, DME, to one VOR radial DME, and then just to, uh, just to strictly IRS navigation. Um, interestingly, not, interestingly enough, the airplane could navigate by just IRS information without any radio update information and do just fine. It would be uh, slightly off the more time you fly because of the uh, error accumulated. But with GPS airplanes, it's pretty much right on uh, all the time. Let's take a look at the virtual simulator and see a little of the map mode in action. This is the EFIS, this is the ND and this is the map mode. So again I'll freeze the simulator here just for a second to look at some of the uh, symbology. Again just above it is the EFIS control panel because this is where you control a lot of the information that's on the ND. You can see in this case Kixco is the active waypoint. We're going to get there at 1731.5 Zulu. It's 94.7 nautical miles in front of us. Our ground speed is 460, our true airspeed is 485, and the wind is coming from 262 at 25 knots. We're in the expanded compass rows. Uh, we know that because we're not seeing the full compass rows. And again, that is a uh, 80 degree uh, from side to side compass arc. And then, of course, we have it's a track up display. So track is the white track line moving from the airplane symbol up to the top. Heading is displayed, as we talked about in the heading section, the upside down triangle. In this case, we are magnetic. And our map is represented by the magenta line. All down track waypoints are white. The active waypoint is magenta. Uh, nav data is on the lower left and lower right of the uh, ND. This data is coming from the NAVRAD page. Again, the GPS is being used for uh, radio position updating. All three IRUs are being used for the triple mix position. And our data to the left here under the data strip shows that we're, we have the, we're in the train mode and we have traffic displayed. So we don't have any of our other switches uh, on up here. Um, the data switches off because we don't see any times by our waypoint. Uh, the position switches off because you don't see your position. Uh, the train switches on, we said. The airport switches off. The waypoint switches off. The station switches off. Otherwise, you'd see uh, STA for station down here. And weather is off in this case, since you can display only weather or terrain on one ND. 
Uh, if you're unsure of this, uh, unsure of the EFIS control panel, you can go to our EFIS control panel video and that will explain more about the use of the EFIS control panel. Let's resume the video and the simulation. Let's look at the ND range. We have a range from anywhere from 5 miles to 640 nautical miles. Um, the range selector right now is moved to the 320 nautical mile range. Again, half the selected range is shown on the ND. So you can see 160 is in the middle. Now we switch to the 160 mile range. 80 miles is in the middle. Each hash mark would be 40, 80, 120, and 160. Let's go back to the 160 mile range like we have here. And now we're back into the 320 mile range. We said we're in the expanded mode. Let's switch to the centered mode and see what that looks like. In order to do that, you have to push the center switch. And then that puts us in a full 360 degree compass arc. You can see in this case, we're in the 320 mile range. Now we've got a 80 mile mark in front of us, 160 at the top, 80 behind us, and 160 at the bottom for a total of 320 nautical miles. Again, the map mode is a moving map display. So you'll see we were in LNAV going to Kixco, which is the active waypoint. But now I'm taking my heading bug, putting it to 230, going to heading select. The airplane will now turn off the our active route. And you can see that uh, everything kind of moves beneath us. The triangle stays fixed. Uh, however, the map, everything underneath the triangle, if you will, is moving. And now you can see we're moving in relation to our route of flight. We're moving off of it as we take a heading uh, given by ATC, perhaps. Again, you can see that I'm in the 320 nautical mile range. This would represent... Uh, 80 miles, 160, uh, 240, and 320. I had to think there for a second. So you go, uh, if we go back to Kixco now, we make a route modification. You saw it, it was a white dashed line, and then it went to a solid magenta as we executed. Uh, we've gone back to LNAV, and the airplane turns to Kixco. The three little, we could pause this. Let's pause the simulation here for a second. The three little uh, vectors here, they're called trend vectors. Sometimes we call this the noodle. Some people call it the worm. Uh, whenever you turn, you'll see it'll, it'll separate from the track line, and you'll see three little vectors when you're in the uh, higher ranges. If you're in the 40-mile range or greater, you're going to see three trend vectors. And if you get lower than that, if you get to the 20 mile range, you'll only see two of the trend vectors. And if you get to the 10 mile range, you'll only see one of the trend vectors. Uh, the trend vector represents where you're going to be in 30, 60, and 90 seconds. Uh, it helps you judge turns. Um, useful when you're hand flying sometimes to lead a turn because you can see where you're going to be uh, in the next. 30 seconds if you're in the lower ranges or perhaps 30 and 60 seconds if you're in a little higher range or 30, 60, and 90 seconds like you see here. So that is called a trend vector. Let's resume the simulation. And again looking at the Pause the simulation here for a minute, looking at the, um, you can see now we're in the 80 mile range. And again, in front of us, you're going to have not half the selected range like you had in the expanded mode, but in the full compass uh, centered mode, the full 360 mode, uh, you're going to have a quarter of the selected range. So in this case, you'll see that 20 miles is in front of us, a range mark for that. The top of the scale would be 40, and then we'd have 20 miles behind us uh, marked uh, with a little hash mark, as you can see here. 
and then 40 miles behind us. So you have a total of 80 miles displayed just in a full 360 compass arc. It's uh, useful for looking behind you when you need to look at something behind you. You go to the full 360 mode. You can see there are information circles along your route of flight. Uh, in this case, since we've reached our cruise altitude, this is showing the uh, representation of where we can make a step climb. Other circles you could have would be your to the top of climb, which would be T slash C, or to the end of descent, E slash D, if we're starting down from VNAV. You can have a, end, a, a top of descent point, T slash D. Uh, you can have two circles that represent deceleration circles. Uh, the first one where you're going to be starting your slowing, and the second one where you'll be at 10,000 feet at 10, 240 knots. And on the VNAV profile, VNAV would do that for you automatically. Of course, we'll get more into that when we look at the uh, some VNAV profiles during the auto flight section. Okay, that completes our discussion of the map mode of the ND and some of the symbology. Let's lower the HUD and go flying. Till our next briefing, keep the blue side up. Captain Al, out.